Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased uh, to welcome you uh, to this IIEA webinar, and we're delighted uh, to be joined today by Ambassador Nick Burns, who has been generous enough to take uh, time out of his busy schedule to talk to us, to speak to us, to take our questions um, this afternoon. Ambassador Burns will give his presentation on the crisis in uh, transatlantic relations and will also discuss other global challenges, including the US relationship with NATO and the European Union. Uh, Ambassador Burns will draw on his distinguished career in the US Foreign Service to discuss the evolving US-EU relationship ahead of November's elections and in light of the challenges presented by COVID-19 and the economic crisis. After Ambassador Burns uh, shares his initial remarks, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom as usual, which you should see on your screen. And this event is on the record. And in asking a question, please identify yourself and your affiliation, if any. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And please feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Ambassador Nick Burns is the Goodman Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at Harvard Kennedy School. He is Executive Director of the Aspen Strategy Group and the Aspen Security Forum and a senior counselor at the Cohen Group. Uh, during his 27 years in the US Foreign Service, Ambassador Burns served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Ambassador to NATO, Ambassador to Greece, State Department Spokesman, Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine and Eurasia Affairs at the NSC, Special Assistant to President Clinton and Director for Soviet Affairs for President George H. W. Bush. So in addition to being a distinguished and proud American, Ambassador Burns has deep Irish roots, so we can rightfully also claim him as one of our own. So in any event, Nick, uh, you're very, very welcome indeed this afternoon. Welcome to Dublin, if, even virtually. We look forward to your remarks and your engagement with our members thereafter. So welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Ambassador. Thank you so much for this warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you and, uh, and all your, the participants today. I wish we could be in Dublin. In a better world, in a different world, I would have come over. I would have loved to have done that. Um, but that we'll leave that for another day. Um, I thought, Ambassador, um, in talking about transatlantic relations and talking about US relations with the Republic of Ireland, it might be good just to go over, review a couple of the major trend lines that we see. And then I'm looking forward to a good conversation and good questions. Obviously, Ambassador, as we Americans look out, at the rest of the world, the dominant issue here, the dominant issue in our campaign is the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, as well as the recession, which we're feeling um, in a very heavy way here. It's, it's the uh, most serious recession since 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt came into office uh, and the New Deal began. And, and I think what we're talking about here is the failure of the United States, the European Union, China, Russia, the other big countries in the world to coalesce effectively to fight the coronavirus. I actually would have expected at the very beginning of the crisis uh, back in January, February, March of this year that, um, that China and the United States would have put, put down their cudgels and they would have found a way to cooperate. I would have said the same thing about Russia, the European Union, the United States, and none of it has happened. We've seen the failure of the UN system, not because of, of the Secretary General of the UN, because the major countries have decided not to work through the UN. In the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, you'll remember the G20 became the organizing vehicle to try to unite the world to do something about it. And that has not happened. Uh, the United States and China have decided they're gonna compete rather than cooperate. The G20 has been a bystander, as has been the G7, which is currently being chaired by the United States, but President Trump has made uh, really very little use of it. We see this most clearly now, not just in the immediate response to the coronavirus, but also on the search for a vaccine. It's every country going in, in a different direction. There has been this effort with the COVAX Global Cooperation to try to unite countries around the world in the search for a vaccine and in its distribution, which is gonna be critical because this vaccine may have to come in two doses for each person to whom it's administered. It could be extraordinarily, it will be extraordinarily difficult to administer 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. You'd think you'd wanna have global cooperation. That has not happened. The United States and Russia have said that they will not join the COVAX consortium. China has said 
we'll, we'll, we'll look at it, but it's very difficult to see China actually agree to join it. And so you have every man and woman in every country for themselves, which is not the way for the globe to respond to, pandem to a pandemic. And then in addition, I think Ambassador, I, I must say how much of a mistake I thought it was for the United States to leave the World Health Organization in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, it's like withdrawing funds from the fire department in the middle of a fire as the building is burning and coming down. There's no question that the WHO did not perform seamlessly back in January and February in a very difficult environment in dealing with the Chinese government. There's no question that the Chinese government was not uh, completely above board with the rest of the world. But the WHO is, I think everybody on this call knows, is the most important global health organization. And for a lot of countries that are, that are poor, that are not as wealthy as Ireland or the United States, the WHO is the lifeline to those countries in terms of public health information and recommendations. And I thought it was, um, I, I thought it was a great, great mistake for the US to walk out of it, to withdraw our funding. And um, there's so many lessons learned on this issue of the pandemic. I would say that we've got to learn the lessons quickly because um, as we go from coping with the pandemic to hopefully in 2021, a vaccine phase of this, we're also gonna to have to look ahead at future pandemics. We've had four in the last 17 years. If you uh, count SARS, of course, in 2003, and H1N1 in 2009, and Ebola in 2014, and now the coronavirus, there's every likelihood that the world will be dealing with future pandemics perhaps as severe, perhaps more severe or less severe. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that the world uh, understand how to work together. And it's been, I think, um, a very disappointing performance. So for the transatlantic relationship, that's been a complicating factor. I think a second complicating factor in the transatlantic relationship has become China. Now, you won't be surprised to hear me say, of course, Ambassador, you know the United States very well, having lived here and represented Ireland here, that uh, China has become the major preoccupation I, of both of our political parties and I think of all of our leaders here. Uh, the U.S. and China had had a, a good but complicated relationship over the last 40 years. I would say the emphasis had been on engagement, on trade, on student exchanges, uh, that kind of thing with competition. That's all changed in the last three or four years. Um, now the motivation on both sides of the relationship from Beijing as well as Washington is outright competition for military predominance in the Indo-Pacific region, certainly on trade, uh, as the United States has accused China and many other countries have as well of not living up to its World Trade Organization commitments. Definitely on, in terms of the, the development of AI, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotechnology, the leading digital age technologies, there's a fierce competition between the United States for Ch and China for dominance in the civilian realm, but also as these technologies are militarized, that adds fuel to the fire. I even think there's been an, a sort of ideological competition, almost reminiscent of the worst days of the Cold War. If you listen to Xi Jinping, uh, he is touting his system, the communist system, as the way of the future not just for the Chinese people, but for people around the world. And of course, people in the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Western Europe, Central Europe don't agree with that. Right now, the odd thing is we don't have a John F. Kennedy or a Ronald Reagan, an American president who would rise to meet that ideological challenge with a degree of confidence in expressing democratic values. President Trump has decided uh, that he's not going to stand up for democracy. It's not been a at all a priority for him. In fact, he's been almost silent on this issue. And so you have this curious phenomenon with the US and China competing um, and it's driven both of our political parties in the United States towards outright competition. It's hard to tell a Democrat from a Republican on China. Most Democrats would be supportive of much, not all, but much of what President Trump has done and the Republicans supporting, I think, uh, what most Democrats wanna do. That for us uh, is going to be the central issue going forward, in addition, of course, to climate change. And I think it's a challenge, it's undoubtedly a challenge for the European Union. And I think for the transatlantic relationship, for us to stay together, how Europe responds to the China challenge is going to be, is going to be telling. Uh, certainly 5G 
uh, where you've seen the United Kingdom and Australia and the United States all take a position that Huawei will not be in our networks. I know there's a ferocious debate in Germany over this. It's part of the secession to secede among the candidates um, in the CDU vying to succeed Chancellor Angela Merkel. It is now a major issue in uh, France and I know uh, and of course the Irish are a big part of this in the discussions in European councils in Brussels. I think this is going to be a major issue for the future of the transatlantic relationship. What side will countries fall on? And the question we on this side of the Atlantic has is, is it possible for the European Union to adopt a common position given the variety of views? And given the inroads that China has made through the Belt and Road Initiative with Italy and with Hungary and with Bulgaria, and with Greece and with other countries in the Balkans, you can almost see a Chinese strategy to divide the European Union from within so that the EU cannot achieve a common position. I also think human rights uh, is coming to the fore as we look at China. Um, democracy and certainly autonomy and certainly one country, two systems went out the window this summer, just the last two months as China took these extreme measures it doesn't look like Hong Kong is going to be free anytime soon. Now there are threats to Taiwan. Of course, credible reports for many years of mistreatment of the Uyghur population of Western China, of Xinjiang province, up to a million people put into re-education camps. And if you combine that, and here's where uh, we would say on this side of the Atlantic, Europe needs to have a stronger position on China, or at least a common position. The Chinese uh, aggression, if you will, in the South China Sea, acting illegally, acting well beyond their legal rights and the law of the Sea Treaty of 1972 to effectively colonize much of the Spratly and Paracel Islands of the South China Sea to contest Japanese sovereignty in the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, Chinese aggression on the long 2,500 mile border between India and China and the aggression of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, just in the last two months on the Indian border, another Indian soldier killed last week. Suddenly we're seeing um, an assertive China that we hadn't seen before. China from Deng Xiaoping through Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao primarily focused on rebuilding China, the extraordinary economic Phoenix-like rejuvenation of the Chinese economy. Now under Xi Jinping clearly pushing out to achieve greater military power and political power in a way that I think has almost all the, um, all the neighbors of China quite worried about their future. The counter reaction from the United States has been the development of a very close quadripartite coalition with Japan, Australia, and India designed not to fight China, that would be a catastrophe, but to limit China's military ambitions. I I'm saying all this about the US preoccupation with China because I think it's been the major issue that President Trump has tried to deal with here in all of its manifestations. It's been a major issue in Joe Biden's campaign. It's been, it is the major issue in American foreign policy. And I think as we in the transatlantic relationship go forward, certainly in NATO, but also in the relationship between the US, the European Union, the bilateral relationship between the United States and the Republic of Ireland, I think you'll hear a lot more from Americans about China, the China problem going forward. So that's the second, after the, after the COVID-19 and the recession, the second big priority that I see ambassador for the transatlantic relationship. A third, of course, is Russia. Um, we feel this most acutely in, um, in NATO, of course, um, but Russia continues to be certainly in Ukraine, certainly in Georgia, with his continued tendentious remarks about Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, it's an aggressor. And it continues to wish under President Putin to effectively have some kind of controlling influence, not a reimposition of rule, but a controlling influence on those countries south of its border and west of its border. We're seeing now the very clear threat that Russia is posing if the demonstrations in Belarus get out of hand, if Lukashenko's rule becomes unsteady, Putin has clearly said he's ready to intervene that challenge remains with NATO, uh, and it's an important challenge. And of course, you have the figure of Mr. Navalny, who is just emerging from a medically induced coma in Berlin. He, the German government says it is 100% sure that he was a victim of a ner nerve agent attack, Novichuk. Um, so what are we going to do about that? 
uh, what will the European Union and the United States and Canada and the other countries of the West do? Will there be further sanctions on the Russian Federation? Will Chancellor Merkel decide to do what she has fought very hard not to do, and that is to suspend or cancel altogether the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, gas pipeline project? These issues of Russia and aggressive Russia uh, with Putin being a fairly young man ambassador by your and my estimation, he's in his mid 60s. Um, Putin is in power for the next 10 to 12 years, perhaps even longer. And the Russian Federation containing Russian power becomes a renewed preoccupation of NATO and a bigger problem, I think, uh, for the European Union in trying to work out a common position in the EU on all these issues where Hungary and Greece and other countries are very happy to disrupt the search for a consensus due to their closer relations with the Russian Federation. Um, I would also say, Ambassador, we've got to look at Russia's attempt to further destabilize our elections. We know the Russians interfered in the German, Dutch, and French elections of 2017. They certainly interfered in the American presidential election in a decisive way, perhaps, I was a Hillary Clinton supporter. You might expect me to say that, but that's an objective statement uh, in 2016. And now our authorities here in the US are telling us that they're sure that the Russians now are active in trying to disrupt our 2020 elections, perhaps as trying to assist uh, the President, President Trump's campaign. I am not suggesting that President Trump uh, is involved in this in any way. I'm just suggesting the Russians see that perhaps it's in their interest to have him reelected. You have extraordinary developments here in the last week with Facebook going after the, Ru after the Russian Observer Research Group. This is the organization that originally attacked us in 2016, taking down their Facebook operations. But of course, they'll just morph into a thousand different uh, uh, online identities to continue uh, their operations. This is not a hot war between Russia and and Europe and North America, but it's a, it's a contest of wills that is taking place in cyberspace, that is taking place in more conventional grounds in terms of troop balances in Eastern Europe. Of course, there's the extraordinary and I think very worrisome decline in arms control. I know a lot of Europeans are worried about this. The INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty is out. Of course, it went out about a year ago. The big question that President Trump or Joe Biden will have to make, uh, depending on who's elected, is um, whether or not we continue with the New START agreement. That's the strategic nuclear arms agreement that President Obama and um, President Putin signed a number of years ago. I worry, Ambassador, that we're in the most unstable time for nuclear weapons, probably since you and I were, were young kids uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, young students in those days. Right now, arms control between the United States and the West, NATO and Russia, excuse me, Russia and the West, NATO and Russia, um, is, uh, is suffering. And China is completely unconstrained in its nuclear weapons development. India and Pakistan also unconstrained. We don't want to live in a world where there's nuclear weapons uncertainty. We had built in uncertainty over the, certainty over the last few decades. Now it's disappearing. I think that's a major issue for Europeans and Americans going forward. Finally, Ambassador, let me just say a word about the United States and the United Kingdom, because I'm anxious to go to questions uh, from the audience today in Ireland um, about the United States. And here I'm going to portray perhaps um, my political sensibilities. I think the United States is far, far weaker with President Trump in charge than we were before. I see him as a dramatic departure from the leadership in both political parties. He uh, is someone who is, um, he is determined to pursue a unilateralist and sometimes isolationist, but really a unilateralist uh, policy of going it alone. So you've seen to the great disappointment, I think of the majority of Americans, you've seen uh, President Trump disavow our alliances. He's been the most, he has been the only American president since Harry Truman, who has ever said a word negative about NATO. But it's not just his words, it's his actions. He, hasn't, he has not led NATO. He has cast doubt on the longstanding um, interest that the United States has in participating in NATO. John Bolton, his former national security advisor, interviewed with 
our Aspen Security Forum a month ago this week. And Bolton said, and Bolton is about the most conservative person I've ever met in the United States government, rock rib Republican. Bolton said he feared that if President Trump is given a second term, President Trump would actually withdraw the United States from NATO. So most of us would say here in the United States, the great power differential between the US and Russia is the NATO alliance, 30 of us, Canada, the United States, 28 European countries all together. Um, and so if you withdraw from NATO, as we have withdrawn from the climate change agreement, the Paris agreement, as we've withdrawn from the Iran nuclear deal, the International Organization of Migration during the greatest refugee crisis in, in 75 years, withdrawn now from the World Health Organization, we're looking at a lonely United States pursuing unilateral ambitions in a world where you have to create coalitions and you have to create uh, alliances. So he's weak in the country in the transatlantic relationship. I think the transatlantic relationship is in its worst state. Relations between the US and Canada uh, and the US and Western Europe uh, in our lifetime. That's not where we want it to be, not in a world where we're facing so many different challenges from climate change to the China challenge, to the Russia challenge, to the pandemics. He has not been, as I said before, a defender of democracy and human rights. He's been unilateralist on trade and say what you will about the global trade system. It floated billions of boats upward in the extraordinary prosperity that the Irish, the Americans, everyone else have experienced over the last 50 to 60 years. There's so much uncertainty in the world when the United States turns inward. Um, the only silver lining I can suggest to you is that the great majority of Americans in our public opinion polls do not agree with this direction. If you go issue by issue, support for NATO, support for trade, support for remaining an immigrant nation, we are an immigrant nation. Every one of us comes from someplace else. My two of my grandparents, as you alluded to, came from Clare and Limerick, my father's parents. My great grandparents on my mom's side came from Limerick, Limerick and Kerry and Galway. And so, um, you know, we all have these ties that make America a unique place. And Donald Trump is trying to shut all that down. We've cut immigration in half. He wants to impose a religious means test on it. A hundred years ago, uh, Americans tried to keep Catholics out from Ireland and Italy. And now President Trump is saying, if you live in one of nine majority Muslim countries, you're not welcome. And for the first time in 70 years, we didn't take in a single refugee in December 2019. In January 2020, we normally take in 70 to 100,000 refugees a year, as, as we should, uh, to, to, to um, try to help in the greatest refugee crisis of, of our time. I think President Trump has weakened the United States and we're in, we have a, um, a red hot election underway here. I'd be happy to take questions on it. I'm a Joe Biden supporter, as you can probably tell. Last word, Ambassador, who would have thought, would you and I have predicted five years ago, had we been in a similar meeting, perhaps in Dublin, uh, that the United States and United Kingdom would both be an existential crisis? The United States, for the reasons I just suggested, with the confusion over our strategy and even our purpose in the world, the lack of self-confidence. The United Kingdom going through, and I'll just put this in my words, I think having made a disastrous decision to leave the European Union, disastrous for the future of the United Kingdom, putting, putting the United Kingdom itself in peril, if you think about the public support for Scottish nationalism and a very hot topic on this side of the Atlantic is to watch what's happening in Ireland and perhaps even future prospects for a united Ireland. Uh, and the United Kingdom act, acting so inconsistently, even last week, as you and I were talking about before we came on this program today, with um, a lot of brinksmanship and drama and histrionics in the negotiations between the UK government and a very strong and fine negotiator, Michel Barnier on behalf of the European Union. All I can say is Brexit's gonna hurt the United Kingdom. It's gonna diminish the United Kingdom's standing in the world. And I say that as someone who deeply, you know, has supported the special relationship between the US and UK for many decades. And I just fear that Britain will weaken. It won't be good for Ireland. It won't be good for the United States. It certainly won't be good for the EU. Britain was the second largest economy, the most globally oriented of all the EU countries. 
And so um, let us hope that there will be a Brexit agreement orderly and that uh, the United Kingdom and Europe and the United Kingdom and the US and Australia and other countries can return to some kind of semblance of normalcy. But it doesn't look good now, at least if that's what the, the theatrics from London and Brussels tell us. I'll just finish, Ambassador, by saying this. As the UK has exited, a lot of us in the United States who prize the relationship with the EU, and I do, I do not think that the European Union is a competitor to the United States. That's how President Trump sees us. I see the, UK, the EU as it's perhaps our greatest partner on climate change, on, e on the global economy, on, so, on human rights, on so many different issues around the world. The US is going to have to have stronger relations with individual EU members, several of them, because Britain will no longer be able to be the connector between the US and the EU the way it was over the last several decades. And I have two countries in mind. One is Germany, of course, because of Germany's size and its power and its influence. The other is Ireland. I do think it's not just sentimental ties that are very important, obviously. I'm not diminishing that. But it's the fact that Ireland, um, Ireland's a connector state, connector country between the United States and Canada and the European Union because of the degree of interdependence with our economy, the number of joint ventures, because of the English language, I think there's an opportunity. Um, and because of the confidence that we have in each other, Irish and Americans, there's an opportunity to build this relationship up and we should do it. And I hope our ambassadors in both capitals, your successor, my successors in the State Department are thinking along these lines. So those are my thoughts. Sorry to go on a bit longer than I, I wanted, but I'm anxious to get to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Nick. There's, there's plenty of food for, for thought there, obviously. Uh, you've covered a, a vast um, a range of, of issues and concerns um, um, uh, uh, in the relationship, transatlantic relationship, China, Russia, uh, obviously the pandemic and the, um, the, the, our inability, the general inability to work together. But just, uh, obviously, questions are coming in, but just before we get to, uh, to, to these, uh, some of these questions, uh, and I, I think you, you, uh, you mentioned John Bolton there and uh, his fear, even his fears of the future in terms of America and maybe a, a second Trump term and uh, American adherence to some of the global institutions. I mean, is there, I mean, obviously he's, uh, the president has decided to pull out of uh, WHO. Uh, you know, and, and Bolton, I think, specifically referenced NATO, but I mean, um, but is there also a threat to somewhere like the United Nations and other key uh, global or international organizations to which uh, U.S. adherence could be endowed in a second term um, uh, Trump administration? I'd be surprised. I mean, I'd be if President Trump is given a second term ambassador, I'd be surprised if he tried to um, have the United States withdraw from the U.N. altogether. After all, we are the host nation. It's in the city where he lived most of his adult life. And he's been proud of that. Um, and you know, I would say something else. There's also American public opinion in Congress that has to factor in. If President Trump is given a second term, which I sincerely hope he will not, I hope that Joe Biden will be our president. If, but if Trump's reelected, you do have Congress. Now the president, as you know, has great powers in foreign affairs under our constitution, but Congress can block. Congress has the power of the purse. It has to appropriate all funds. And it's interesting to see that there is actually great divergence between President Trump and senior members of the Republican Party in Congress on a number of foreign policy issues. Number one on Russia. Trump has been infamously uh, buddies with Vladimir Putin, has never criticized the Russian government. That's not the attitude of senior Republicans who are very anti-Russian. Number two is NATO. NATO is very popular in the United States, 75% public support. I mean, you can't get 75% of our public to say the sky is blue these days in a divided America, but you can get them to say in polls, we believe in NATO. And so Congress could, I think, effectively probably block any attempt by President Trump to pull us out of NATO altogether. There are rising majorities in the United States in favor of climate change, in favor of being part of the Paris Agreement, of doing our bit to mitigate the worst aspects. And the American people still support legal immigration, not illegal immigration on the southern border, but the kind of legal immigration that brought millions of Irish and Italians and others to the United States uh, and people from all over the world. And so um, in that eventuality that there's a second Trump term, I think there'll be battles uh, between Congress and the president if he tries to do these extreme measures. 
that would essentially change the character of how America relates to the rest of the world. Yeah, and uh, Nick, I mean, obviously, it, it's good to hear that there's uh, such a, a widespread appreciation of NATO. You yeah, mentioned 75 percent, which is unusual uh, in current circumstances. So that's, uh, and of course, America is a member of NATO. But uh, what what is the perception, though, of, of the European Union? I mean, in my time in the United States, you know, there was a general challenge in conveying a sense of the entity of the European Union. Yes, of course, the United States uh, uh, maintained key bilateral relationships with the member, the key member states of the European Union, uh, but uh, it was always a bit of a struggle, I think, to have a, 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 a to convey a wider sense, and we obviously work very actively to do so. And our uh, the, the European Union in the United States does this continuously, but it's a constant struggle uh, to create an appreciation uh, of the European Union as an entity and as the kind of the the, the phenomenon that it is, I suppose. And uh, and what can we do basically to to um, enhance that appreciation of what the European Union is all about? Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Ambassador. Um, most Americans obviously understand what the European Union is, but probably don't know much about it. Most, uh, I, most press attention in this country tends to focus on individual European countries, on Ireland, the UK, Germany, France, et cetera, not so much in the EU. But for those people who, are, who populate our governments, from the State Department to the Treasury Department to the White House to Congress, there's a keen recognition of what it is. Um, when I was in the State Department as Under Secretary of State, uh, looking at our global diplomacy, I would think our number one partner globally was probably the European Union on issue after issue. And I named them before, human rights, the rule of law, climate change, global trade. We've not always, you know, we're competitive on trade between the US and EU, but, the, but that competition's far outweighed by the totality of what we do together. So what should we do to correct that? Public information. Uh, on the part of the United States government, but as well as European Union governments uh, to, and I'm sure you did your, your part in this when you were ambassador traveling around the United States, talk to the American public about how important it is that, that we, we coalesce. I think it does make sense to most Americans, as I'm sure it does to most Irish, that we've entered a time in global history where no country can live on an island itself and just forget, try to forget the rest of the world. That's in essence, the Trump policy, build walls, dig moats, pull up the drawbridges around the, you know, around the country. It simply doesn't work in an age of climate change and cyber aggression and a globally interconnected world. And, and that's the message that I think our younger generation gets that, by the way, I, I teach. So I'm with a lot of millennials in the classroom. They get that. They understand the degree of interdependence uh, we just need to reach the entire population. Good. i uh, just take a few questions here, if we may, Nick. Um, so a two-part question from Sonia Highland, who's our political director in the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs in Dublin here. Uh, the first part is, in the event of a Biden administration, what are likely to be the key priorities uh, of that administration in, foreign, in the foreign policy sphere? And secondly, as Ireland prepares to join the European Security Council, of which we will be a member starting in January uh, 2021, uh, what are the areas that we can engage on uh, to maximise our impact and influence as a member of the Council for the two-year term uh, beginning um, uh, in January 2021? Thank you very much. On the first question, um, I think there are stark differences between President Trump and, and Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden has been clear from the first day of his campaign, but clear throughout his political career. He believes that NATO is central to the United States, of central importance. He believes in the European Union, obviously, and the US-EU relationship. Uh, he's been very critical of President Trump's uh, inattention to the transatlantic relation, the deterioration of those relations. Um, the last time uh, Vice President Biden went to the Munich Security Conference, was not this past February, but February before, February 2019, he gave a speech uh, on the floor. And it was all about the fact that the United States and Europe have common interests and common values and that we have to work together. And, and he said something at the end, I'll never forget. He said, you know, those Americans who believe in the US-EU relationship and in NATO will be back. And I'm very much hopeful that, um, that he will be back in power in the White House on January 21st of 2021. So I think in a Biden presidency, you'll see um, a president who is sophisticated about global affairs, who has vast experience, who's respectful of our allies, who won't make insulting comments 
uh, incessantly about the Chancellor of Germany, the Prime Minister of Canada, the former Prime Minister, Prime Minister May of the United Kingdom. I've not heard a single word of criticism about our Irish leaders by Donald Trump because he probably knows how important Ireland is in elections in the United States. But um, you'll, you'll, have a, uh, you'll have a president of the United States and Joe Biden who will be the kind of president who will want to work closely with Europe and that'll be a major change from President Trump. In terms of our, uh, the UN Security Council agenda um, over the next two years, I think it's very good that Ireland's going to be uh, on the council among the 15. Certainly, I think trying to bind the world together on climate change and accelerate um, our ability to work together, to me, that's one of the major priorities. Secondly, uh, the UN Secretary General just announced on Friday uh, looming famine in Congo, in Northeast Nigeria, in South Sudan, and in Yemen. So dealing with the crisis spots in the Middle East and Africa, possible food shortages. I think a major issue for the Council, the UN Security Council going forward the next two years is, is this issue of a pandemic ambassador, what we talked about at the very beginning. How do we, how do we strengthen the World Health Organization? How does the World Health Organization reform itself? Because it did not perform perfectly in January and February in the early months. How do we make sure that these UN agencies that are so important, the World Health Organization, the UN, um, hum the UN Human Rights Council, which is deeply flawed uh, in my judgment, the UN High Commissioner of Refugees at a time when there are 69 million refugees and internally displaced people. I think strengthening the UN system is going to, is, is, is it in all of our interests and it's the work that all of us have to do. And of course, conflict prevention. Can the U UN Security Council um, speak with one, one voice? Probably not, given the divisions between China and Russia on the one hand, the UK, France, and the US on the other among the five permanent members. But certainly Ireland has so much credibility in the world because you've been so active in support of UN peacekeeping missions. You've been one of the you know, key countries in Europe supporting the UN across the board. I think that's a special voice. And can we, can we have those five permanent members come together on big issues? Probably not on issues of war and peace, but on some of these other issues, I think it's possible. Okay. So uh, just a question here from um, um, Adrian Pam, uh, uh, the Dutch ambassador here in Dublin, and it's really focused on um, um, trade relations between, uh, I suppose, the UK and the US, and indeed between the EU and US. Uh, and you mentioned there earlier on, I mean, when I was in the United States, one of the reasons we had an opportunity to promote the, US, the EU at that time was because we had TTIP and Prospect. This was back in 2013. Right. And it was the most wonderful thing to go around the United States and say, this is the agenda. And you know, people could relate to that in a very, very um, particular way. Well, obviously TTIP uh, never quite materialized or hasn't materialized yet. But uh, just in terms of an EU, uh, US um, uh, relationship, trading relationship, um, or an EU, or a UK, uh, US relationship, I suppose, uh, what are the red lines for the United States in terms of uh, such relationships between either the UK and the United States or the EU and the United States? in terms of future trade agreements? Or is there indeed uh, um, the prospect of such agreements, whether with the UK or with the EU between the United States and uh, 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 in the future? You know, I think this is entirely uncertain and a difficult issue to forecast because trade has become a highly contested issue in our country, inside the Republican Party, inside the Democratic Party, and, and between them. Um, the one bright spot here is that we were able to, President Trump was able to renegotiate with Canada and Mexico um, the old NAFTA. It's now called uh, the USMC agreement, US-Mexico-Canada agreement. It was updated and modernized, which it frankly needed to do from its origins in 1993 and 1994. The big issue was that Democrats and Republicans were able to come together. It was one of the few major issues where the Nancy Pelosi majority, the majority led by the Speaker of the House, and President Trump were able to work together because the Democrats wanted to build into the agreement environmental standards, greater environmental standards, deeper, and labor standards, and, and they were able to do that. And so if, if there's any way forward is perhaps to look at those negotiations, look at the final agreement among the three North American countries and say, could we possibly do this 
with other parts of the world. Of course, President Trump, if he's reelected, is very decidedly, I would say in his case, passionately opposed to big multilateral trade agreements. He, he has said, and he ran on this, he's running on this again, that these are disadvantageous to the United States. He prefers bilateral trade agreements. I, I simply don't know what a Biden administration would want to do. I, I wouldn't want to try to speculate. It would be unfair to, to Vice President Biden to do that. But it's going to be highly contested. Most of the talk in the United States in the last few years is the regret that many of us have that the Trans-Pacific Partnership did not go forward. That was the big power move by the democratic countries of the Pacific against China to force China to trade fairly. And we gave it all up. Um, I would say this, what if the European Union and the United States and Japan, that's more than 60% of global GDP, came together and at least tried to coalesce below the level of a treaty to force the Chinese, or to try to push the Chinese, I should say, uh, to adhere to their WTO commitments. I think that the European Union and the United States have a, si a quite similar problem with China, a China that won't adhere to the rules. And we have leverage if we work together. But a big agreement between the US and the United States, a free trade agreement, um, the European publics did not want that in the Obama-Biden years, as you'll remember. Um, I think it's just unpredictable right now to know what the market would bear in Europe and what the market would bear in the United States. It's the issue that I think is most difficult to read here in the United States as we go forward. Okay. Uh, so just a question here from Blair Horn, who's an IAEA member. He says, what do you think are Putin's uh, long-term aims? Um, is a sphere of influence over ex-Soviet states, or does he have territorial ambitions on the Western Russian border? I think that Putin, it, well, first of all, he's smart, he's agile, he's very experienced, the most experienced leader of a major country in the world is Vladimir Putin. Any idea that he could um, try to reconquer uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the three Baltic states that were forcibly incorporated into the Soviet Union in 1940, I don't think he'll go in that direction because he understands how much more powerful NATO is uh, uh, collectively, uh, and certainly the US is over Russia militarily. So what does he do? He does, he, he operates from the KGB playbook, which you, would, you, which you would expect from someone who is in the KGB. He uses cyber aggression. He uses intelligence service to murder or try to murder the domestic opponents uh, of the Russian Federation. Look at Navalny who nearly died from that vicious attack. He then, of course, uh, has twice used force against Georgia 2008, Ukraine 2014, against countries not in the NATO alliance. So I think that Putin is very, very determined to make sure that countries that lie close to his border are not a military threat. Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, certainly would never want to see a fully democratic anti-Russian regime in Armenia or Azerbaijan, if you think south of the Russian Federation and the Caucasus, and west of the Russian Federation in Moldova, Ukraine, uh, Belarus. There's a standoff when it comes to Poland and the Baltic states, and fortunately NATO has troops there. So I think that we can contain Russian power there, but NATO is not gonna to go to war to protect countries that are not members, and those are the countries that are in Russia's gun sites right now. Okay, just maybe switch back to China, if we may, um, uh, from Russia to China. So a question here from Bill Emmett, who is a former editor of The Economist, uh, now living in Dublin, I think. He says, we see that in the US there is a bipartisan consensus on being tough on China, and you mentioned that. Uh, but being tough, he says, is not a strategy. What do you think a Biden administration um, China strategy would likely consist of on trade, security, technology, decoupling, Hong Kong, Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So I suppose uh, Biden on China. Bill was a great editor of The Economist and a friend of mine. Pleasure. I wish I could see him on a, a Zoom call. But Bill, let's be in touch. Um, the one thing, you know, I, I am um, ambassador, as you may know, one of the many advisors to Vice President Biden. So the last thing I want to do here, I'm not, I don't want to speak for him and I don't want to predict what he might do because that just wouldn't be fair to him. So I'll just speak about my own view. Bill, I think the major challenge that the United States and the EU and Japan and Australia are having these days is, how do we balance two things with China? We know that we have to compete peacefully, but compete economically, in our case, compete for military positioning, compete ideologically. 
and, and there's no question that most of the energy right now, I would say even in Europe, but certainly in the United States and Australia and India and Japan is towards competition. On the other hand, we have to cooperate with China on certain issues. We should be cooperating on the pandemic. We have to cooperate on uh, a global economic resurgence to leave the recession behind. And we certainly have to cooperate on climate change where the US and China, China and the US in that order are the one and two carbon emitters, leading carbon emitters in the world. We've had trouble achieving that balance in the last couple of years. Well, the extreme views in the Republican Party want to decouple the US economy, the global, the Western democratic economy from China, which I think is undesirable and impossible to achieve and potentially catastrophic for the entire world. Um, people on the right, far right, even talk about regime change in Beijing as if that's something that the United States or Europe has the possibility of achieving. I think that's dangerous. I don't like what the Chinese are doing in Hong Kong or in Xinjiang province. And we ought to be very clear about our, all of us in the EU and the US about our displeasure, but we have to live with China. So achieving that balance between competition and cooperation, I think that's the single most difficult thing for the EU the US, Japan, India, Australia, the countries that have major stakes here, and that often disagree with the Chinese leadership. So I think struggling with that and um, trying to regain some degree of self-confidence in the United, uh, that we Americans have in our own global role, I think Donald Trump has harmed our self-confidence. That to me is probably step one. Thank you, Bill. And just to, just to follow up on that, if I may, Nick, uh, can the um, obviously the European Union at the moment is um, is um, and its 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 relationship with China is a very sensitive issue um, uh, for individual member states. Can the European Union have a um, straddle um, uh, the the the, uh, the United States, as it were, and China? Can it have a kind of a, a position which is um, obviously mindful of the United States, but nonetheless? Um, independent of the United States and still kind of, um, uh, you know, with, 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 with that level of kind of concern and skepticism towards, uh, uh, towards China? It's a really good question. It's a question that really only Europeans can answer. I simply can. I certainly don't want to be disrespectful and uh, dictate what Europe should do, obviously. But I will say this, I, as I perceive the argument on your side of the Atlantic, as I read The Economist uh, and look at the debate in, in Brussels, um, you're divided on this issue. Uh, 5G has divided the European Union, certainly. The degree to which the EU should be speaking out more strongly than it did this past summer on Hong Kong and the Uyghurs, that's an issue. And as a friend of Europe and as someone who wants to strengthen the transatlantic relationship, my advice, if you're asking for it, is obviously none of us would want to end our relationship with China. We all have, all of us have pivotal economic ties. Look at Germany, look at the United States, for instance, Italy. Um, and yet we've got to be united on the issues that count. Human rights, uh, certainly. Um, not permitting the Chinese intelligence services to be reading all of our mail and our phone calls in the future. That's, the high, that's, that's part of the 5G challenge with Huawei. Um, I think we, we ought to try to achieve Western positions, US EU positions as much as possible. My sense, Ambassador, just looking at the debate in Europe is that it's gotten more complicated. And perhaps Europe is more deeply divided now because these are, really, these are very tough issues. My sense in Germany is that the, the, um, the, the debate is changing quickly in favor of those who believe that Germany needs to be more tough-minded uh, on the case, on the issue of China. So the idea that Europe could kind of straddle between these two economic and political and military behemoths, China and the United States, I'm not sure that's realistic. Because as I look at most of these issues, we're gonna be a lot stronger and better off if we try to align ourselves, the US and EU, um, rather than have the EU straddle between the US and China. Yeah, just um, uh, Nick, if I may, a question here from Alan Jukes, who's our former former Prime Minister, our former leader of the, um, the Fine Gael Party and former Director General of the IIEA, my predecessor, one of my predecessors here. And we're back to the Biden uh, campaign again. Um, 
And um, in addition to your good self, we're very mindful of the fact that his chief of staff is also Irish, uh, the, the, the staff uh, campaign leader. And um, so uh, uh, President Biden, uh, if he is elected uh, as president, obviously has, uh, has very, very strong connections with here. But in any event, um, he said, will the Biden, uh, Alan Jukes wants to know, will the Biden campaign feature any of uh, the concerns you have expressed about uh, Trump's uh, unilateralism? Um, oh, very um, definitely. If you look at um, Joe Biden's website, but just look at his speeches and what he's been saying consistently for the last year and a half since he's been running, uh, Vice President Biden has, has you know, accused President Trump of weakening our country, of disavowing our friendships, of being disrespectful to allies such as Chancellor Merkel, of not being engaged uh, on issues like climate change. So for instance, Vice President Biden has said, if he's elected, he will return the United States to the Paris Climate Change Agreement. He has said he will return the United States to the World Health Organization. He's cast doubt and, and severely criticized President Trump's um, decision just a month ago to withdraw 12,500 American troops from Germany. Why did he do that, President Trump? Simply because of his personal animosity, uh, which is bizarre to say the least, uh, with Chancellor Merkel which is entirely one-sided. Uh, it's President Trump's problem. So I think that there, is a, there, are, there are great, great differences of attitude, of philosophy, of experience between Vice President Biden and, uh, and President Trump. Vice President Biden has said time and again that our alliances and coalitions make the United States stronger and that he's dedicated to them. And that's the US-EU relationship, that's NATO. And so you'll, you'll look at an American president who is much more in line with the majority of the American people, Joe Biden, on foreign policy, and with the majority of both parties in Congress on most of these issues. And in the American tradition, I think Donald Trump is the great outlier in the last uh, 75, 80 years of American history. Uh, I don't think we will, if, if he is defeated on November 3rd, we won't see his brand of diplomacy repeated uh, anytime soon. Okay, Nick, maybe um, uh, just a question, uh, in addition to your good self, of course, uh, who, who, uh, as an advisor to uh, the, uh, the Biden campaign, who else um, among those that we might know of uh, are around uh, the president and the campaign uh, giving input uh, into the foreign policy agenda on the issues that we're talking about, the, the key issues that we're talking about here today? I say well, in, addition, in addition to your good self. Well, I'm just one of hundreds of people, actually. Uh, there are hundreds of there are lots and lots of people supporting Joe Biden, from current and former members of Congress to former secretaries of state like John Kerry, whose Secretary Kerry has been so active in support of uh, Vice President Biden. Um, he has great, great support across the Democratic Party. And it is interesting to see, you know, for most of my career ambassador, I was, I was a civil servant, foreign service officer. So we were, um, we were not allowed to be political. We were nonpartisan. I served Republican and Democratic uh, administrations, but it's interesting to see in a party that has been famously divided for the last 30 or 40 years, the Democratic Party and election after election, we're seeing a lot of unity in the Democratic Party. Um, all of the people who ran against Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, um, are supporting him vociferously. Of course, Kamala Harris is the vice presidential nominee, and that's a very powerful ticket. So. I, I do think that there's an appreciation here in the United States that we've lost our way, that our country's in big trouble, that we're not being the kind of global partner we should be, and that we're in big trouble at home. And we have a pandemic crisis here. We have the worst record of any major country on infections and deaths. We're acutely, acutely aware of that here. We have the economic crisis, greatest crisis since 1933. We have the racial crisis which for us is, is the existential issue in American history. The most important issue in our history has been, has been slavery, has been the denial of racial justice until this day to the African-American community. You saw this powerful, powerful set of people, set of demonstrations, almost all peaceful, some violence, but mostly peaceful this summer. And the president has divided us on race and he's effectively become a candidate of white supremacy if you look at his public statements just over the last couple of weeks. And so you look at a country and add to that a leadership crisis, we're deeply divided, we're in search of a leader, 
my sense is that Vice President Biden will supply that leadership. He's a unifying figure. And, um, and if we have four more years of Donald Trump, I really shudder to think as a citizen what's going to become of us now inside the country as a, as a community, but also in terms of our foreign and defense policy. Thank you. Um, just a question here from Fiona Broderick, who's a Department of Foreign Affairs, Deputy Director of U.S. Relations. Um, uh, she wants to know, and this is coming back, uh, I suppose, to your point about um, uh, Ireland being a connecting state uh, between a bridge, as uh, some people might like to describe it. But she wants to know, how can Ireland most effectively play a role on building transatlantic relations? What can we do as a member of the EU and our own bilateral uh, relations with the United States to uh, to uh, to develop the relationship. Well, I think it's a matter. I mean, there is already there's already trust between Dublin and Washington for historical reasons. Uh, we've never had a crisis with Ireland, um, and so I think to build on that kind of trust. Let me explain what I meant by that, Ambassador. It's a very good question. When I was Under Secretary of State, I used to. Um, call nearly every morning, or he would call me, John Soares, who was then the political director in the British Foreign Office. Later, he became chief of MI, MI, MI5. And um, as a British diplomat, John, I could reasonably, I could trust. He could help us understand Brussels, specifically the European Union, and then translate the EU back to us, um, EU views in a way that was extraordinarily helpful. It's not as if we didn't have a direct relationship, of course we did, but Britain played that kind of middle connecting role, which was important for us. The United States feels more comfortable in NATO because we're a member of NATO, the leading member of NATO. Um, we're not part of the EU system. We are sometimes competitive with the EU, sometimes a partner. And so I think, I think the United States needs that kind of partner. We don't have that kind of relationship with Germany yet, certainly not in the Trump administration with his personal antipathy towards, which is, which is uh, a terrible thing uh, with Chancellor Merkel. And there is trust in Ireland. And so I think Ireland is a bridge of trying to help the Americans understand the perspective of Brussels, help Brussels understand the perspective of the United States. If I were in government today, I would certainly think on the American side, we'd want that kind of relationship. And there are very few countries in the world where I'd say that there's clear, you know, unaltered, unadulterated trust. We have it with Australia. We have it with Canada. We have it with the UK. I think we have it with Ireland. It's different because we don't have the military relationship that we have with the others, but we have such a deep economic relationship. And, you know, you mentioned the number of Irish Americans in the Biden campaign. There are a lot of Americans in the Trump administration too, as you know. And this is a special bond. And we should take advantage of it in this relationship. And I think Dublin and Washington ought to be working more closely together on this EU issue, and on especially because Ireland will be on the Security Council on global issues. Yeah, Nick, thank you for saying that. Um, just maybe we're just coming to the last um, last uh, roundup here, and um, uh, just just a few minutes left. Um, just maybe we could turn to the Brexit issue, uh, given its uh, topicality, its its critical importance uh, uh, to Europe, uh, to Britain, and to to, uh, to Ireland in particular. And there's been a lot of concern in the last few days about uh, whether or not um, uh, uh, the UK was seeking to uh, uh, find a way of, of modifying uh, the, uh, the withdrawal agreement, and specifically the protocol uh, in relation to the border area, uh, the border in, 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 on the island of Ireland. And as you know, I mean, this was an issue that was supposed to have been addressed. Uh, comprehensively yeah. and agreed. Um, so, I mean, a U.S., uh, you know, to the extent that there is U.S. concern about, um, uh, you know, whether, I mean, within Irish America and within the Biden campaign, uh, can Ireland, as it were, count on, 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 a, on a President Biden in upholding the Good Friday Agreement and being supportive of uh, the no hard border on the island of Ireland? Well, Ambassador, again, I don't, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to be in a position of predicting what a President Biden would do in January, February of, of next year. That would be unfair of me. I would point to Nancy Pelosi, uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. You will remember in August 2019, just over a year ago, she issued a public statement and a letter saying in no uncertain terms that if a hard border was reimposed by the British on the island of, Ar uh, on the island of Ireland in a way that completely um, overrode all the good that the Good Friday Agreement did, the United States Congress, Democratic majority, would not ratify 
a US-UK free trade agreement. That was Speaker Pelosi's judgment. There is very strong support for Ireland in the United States Congress. I come from the capital of Irish America, which is Boston and Massachusetts. So I feel it deeply here among, um, you know, there's Congressman Neal, uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, one of the most powerful members of Congress is an Irish American congressman from Massachusetts. And so um, I'm, I think that's an important point for, for the Irish people to be reassured by that in the Congress of the United States, in the House of Representatives, very strong support that uh, you not be forced to go back uh, to a time you don't want to go back to before the Good Friday Agreement or the Troubles, and that we Americans do not want to contribute to any kind of deterioration of relations among the Protestants and Catholics of Northern Ireland or friction between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And that is about as clear a position as I can see in American politics. And so I guess I read last week's events, the statements that the Boris Johnson government made is rather theatrical, probably trying to seek advantage over the EU and the negotiations. Uh, I hope that the British understand the depth of feeling here for Ireland in the United States Congress and in the American public in general. And I hope that's a clear answer to your question. That's a very clear answer, Nick. I appreciate it very much. We appreciate it very much. I'm sure all our listeners do too. So listen, we've come to the end and we're right on the button at uh, two o'clock here in Ireland, a little bit earlier in, in Boston. We want to just say thank you to you. Um, uh, thank you for your service indeed uh, over such a, a lengthy um, spell in the US government and, and since then obviously doing what you've been doing. Uh, but most of all, just thank you for being with us today and sharing your insights. I mean, we obviously hear a lot from the United States, but to have it crystallized and to have it articulated the way you've done today, I think would be widely appreciated. So we hope we can re welcome you back in person, welcome you home indeed, uh, at some time in the not too distant future. In the meantime, obviously, uh, we wish you well, uh, take care of yourself, and, uh, and we follow events, particularly over the next uh, six to eight weeks, with particular interest. Thanks, Ambassador. It's been a pleasure. It's been great to be with so many friends from Ireland. Hopefully next time in Dublin. I'd like to do that post-vaccine. Post very good. Okay. Thanks thank so you much. very much indeed. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody, and th thank you very much, Nick.